Welcome back to Sissy Maya. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to never miss an update. Additionally, consider subscribing to my Patreon to get access to these features, and much more. As a precocious six-year-old, a sunny September day marked a pivotal moment in my life. I vividly recall the occasion when my mother introduced me to ballet, a memory etched as clear as day. Questions arose as to why she chose ballet over other activities like Cub Scouts or soccer. Despite my typical boy pursuits of playing with trucks and getting dirty, I was also drawn to the arts. With prior experience in Suzuki violin and piano, along with art classes, I was already exploring creativity. When my mother proposed ballet, I was intrigued to understand its allure beyond the performances like the Nutcracker that I had witnessed. The following day, she treated me to a rehearsal of a local ballet troupe, one she had danced with in her youth. It was exhilarating to witness the graceful dancers in perfect harmony, with muscled male counterparts executing leaps and lifts, all set to the enchanting music. Meeting the dancers, I was greeted warmly, my mother's reputation preceding me. A ginger-haired ballerina embraced me, expressing anticipation for my joining them. I, taken aback by the idea of dancing, simply smiled in response. Before I could decline, my mother declared my imminent training, envisioning me dancing with the company by sixteen. As we departed, I inquired about ballet lessons, unfamiliar with anyone else taking them. Assured by my mother that I would enjoy it, she hinted that classmates might be starting alongside me. As a young and inexperienced first grader, the following day at school brought an uncomfortable dose of embarrassment. During recess, I eagerly questioned my peers about their plans for starting ballet, only to be met with dismissive responses from most boys, who scoffed at the notion, citing it as feminine. A handful of girls expressed excitement about their own ballet endeavours, but upon learning of my interest, they too reacted negatively, associating ballet with girlishness and teasing me about wearing pink tights. This was a shock to me, as I had been raised in a household free from gender stereotypes, thanks to my single mother who emphasised being true to oneself. Despite my father's absence, my bond with my mother was strong, and she always encouraged me to pursue my passions. By age five, I was proficient in both piano and violin. The day concluded with my classmates gossiping about my ballet aspirations, prompting our teacher, Ms. Thornton, to address the class, highlighting the validity of boys participating in ballet and mentioning renowned male dancers. However, this only intensified the ridicule, cementing the belief among my peers that my interest in ballet stemmed from a desire to be feminine. Upon returning home, tears streamed down my cheeks, and my mother rushed to comfort me. As I poured out my heart, she enveloped me in a tight embrace, assuring me of my talents and rights. She encouraged me not to let the ignorance of my classmates deter me from pursuing ballet, emphasizing that they would eventually come to appreciate my diverse skills. Concerned about wearing girls' tights, I hesitated, but my mother insisted that proper attire was necessary for flexibility and alignment. She explained the historical significance of tights for male dancers and reassured me that my friends would support me, though this proved untrue in the end. Despite the initial disappointment, my mother's words offered solace, reminding me that new friendships awaited me in ballet class. So that brings us to the fateful day in September many years ago that changed me forever. After school that day when I got home, mom was there, waiting for me with my ballet gear. Avery, since the studio doesn't have changing rooms, we'll get you into your dancewear here. Mommy, you mean I have to wear tights outside? No, dear, you can put on a pair of sweatpants over them until we get to the studio. Now let's get undressed. After taking off all my clothes, Mom handed me a small thing that kind of looked like underwear, but it wasn't. That's a dance belt, Avery. All guy. Dancers wear them to protect their privates. We both giggled a little. After slipping it on, next came the white t-shirt, followed by a pair of black tights. Mom showed me how to put them on, one leg at a time, bunching up. The material from the toes up. You have to be careful putting tights on, dear, she said. 
They are delicate and you can snag the material quite easily. B. Gentle. So I was careful, very careful. I can still remember the feeling that I had when the waistband of my first pair of black tights reached my midsection. I looked down at my legs. Is this how I was going to portray myself to a class full of kids my age, some I had never even met before? I can still remember that feeling so well. It was like displaying my body for all the world to see. Mom then said you look so sweet. With your beautiful blonde hair you look like a miniature Peter Martins. Mom always took great pride in making sure my hair was well attended to. She trimmed it herself and had always kept it long. When I was five she settled on a Dutch boy style and at six my hair was still in that style. Recently she had refrained from trimming it, and it was reaching my shoulders. I didn't mind, because a lot of the boys in my grade had longer hair, but when I saw myself in the mirror in my dance tights, the lines between boy and girl really started to blur. Okay honey, now put on these white socks, and then I have four pair of ballet slippers for you to try on. We need to find the pair that fits just right. I couldn't believe that now I had to wear shoes that really looked like girls. Shoes. I mean soft black slippers that barely covered my feet, with a black strap across my instep. Mom, these are girls' shoes. No, Avery, they're not. Try this pair on. After three tries, Mom found the perfect fit. Okay. Let's go. Aren't you excited? I am, she said. I'm scared, I said. Avery, you'll have a great time. I promise. You're going to remember this day for the rest of your life. Mom didn't know how right she was then, and I'm not so sure that if she knew how I would turn out, whether she would have taken me to that first class. But she did. Covered in sweatpants, we embarked on the journey to the studio, located in town along Main Street bustling with foot traffic. Approaching the entrance, I glimpsed inside through a large window, realizing with dread that passers-by could peer in at the dancers within. Upon entering, my mother introduced me to Miss Bartow, who had a history with my mother from their nutcracker days. Miss Bartow's inquiry about my enthusiasm for dance triggered a wave of uncertainty within me, exacerbated by her remark about me being the only boy in the class. This intensified the surreal feeling that had gripped me since donning my tights, as if I were relinquishing control over my identity. Despite the initial unease, I soon found solace in the freedom of movement and expression offered by ballet. Despite the whispers and stares from my classmates, I reveled in the joy of dancing, transcending the judgments and stigmas associated with being a male ballet student. As the class progressed, I embraced my newfound identity unaffected by the opinions of others, emerging from that first session with a renewed sense of self. When my mom arrived to pick me up after class, I was so elated by my ballet debut that I dashed out without my sweatpants. With a beaming smile and boundless energy, I approached the car, eager to share my excitement with her. Despite her gentle reminder about my forgotten attire, I brushed off the giggles and teasing from the girls at the studio, focusing instead on recounting my accomplishments and anticipation for the next class. My mom's pride in my newfound passion was palpable, reflecting her unwavering support in nurturing me as an individual, regardless of societal gender norms. Upon returning home, I eagerly demonstrated my newfound skills to her, receiving enthusiastic encouragement and an offer to create a dedicated dance space in our sunroom. Overwhelmed with gratitude, I embraced her proposal, envisioning daily practice sessions enriched by her guidance. This marked a significant milestone in my journey, symbolizing not only a memorable day but also a pivotal moment of self-discovery and acceptance. As the evening descended upon us, I draped a sweater over my tea, but my ballet attire remained a constant companion until bedtime, a testament to the newfound joy and fulfillment I found in dance. The following day, Despite enduring remarks from my classmates, I remained unfazed. Deep down, I felt an unwavering passion for ballet, an innate desire to dance endlessly. If wearing tights was part of the ballet experience, 
Then I embraced it wholeheartedly. I would have donned a dress if my teacher had requested it. Proudly proclaiming my dedication to ballet, I gladly embraced my identity as a dancer. Within a week, our sunroom was transformed into a spacious dance studio, where I would spend countless hours over the next 13 years pursuing my greatest love, ballet. Many of those precious hours were shared with my mother, whose guidance and inspiration fueled my journey in countless ways. She found solace and fulfillment in returning to dance, marking a significant shift from her years in the corporate world. Despite her success as a pioneer in computer programming, with her innovations garnering substantial royalties, she never lost her passion for ballet, having trained for a career in it during her youth. However, her exceptional academic prowess led her to accept a full scholarship to Yale, propelling her into the forefront of computer science. Although offered a faculty position post-graduation, she opted for a corporate role, spending 15 years in the software industry during its rapid expansion, which afforded her not only financial independence but also the opportunity to retire early and focus on her passions, including nurturing me. Moving us from Hartford to the serene Vermont countryside when I was four, she transformed our lives for the better. I owe an immeasurable debt of gratitude to her for her unwavering dedication as a mother, teacher, mentor, and role model, showering me with unconditional love. As you've likely discerned by now, this narrative serves not only as a reflection of my life but also as a tribute to my remarkable mother. Apart from my violin and piano lessons, my afternoons were dedicated to donning my dance attire and practicing various ballet positions and flexibility exercises. My mother, recognizing my growing interest and potential, became increasingly involved in my training. With 15 years of ballet experience, including a decade in regional companies alongside her demanding career in programming for insurance companies, she possessed a wealth of knowledge to impart. Ballet became a bonding experience for us, deepening our connection. Within a couple of months, I discontinued violin lessons to accommodate a second ballet class, this time with older girls aged seven to nine. The teacher, cognizant of my rapid progress, made every effort to support my development through additional classes. Undoubtedly, she felt the weight of my mother's expectations and strove to provide me with the best possible training. During the Christmas break, I found my mother at the sewing machine, meticulously adjusting a hem on one of her dresses. Curious, I approached and inquired about her sewing skills, marveling at the neatness of her work. Pausing the machine, she turned to me, her blue eyes sparkling with warmth. Avery, your grandmother taught me when I was seven, she began, reminiscing. At first, I wasn't too keen on it, as all my energy was devoted to ballet. But as I grew older, I discovered its usefulness for crafting dance costumes and found joy in designing my own creations. Each dress I made became uniquely mine, never resembling the original pattern. Intrigued, I leaned closer to the machine, eager to try my hand at sewing. Thus began another creative endeavor my mother introduced me to, one that I embraced wholeheartedly. Spending several hours each week on sewing projects, I progressed from simple items like potholders to more complex pieces, finding solace and satisfaction in the craft. By the time I turned eight, my ballet skills had flourished, prompting my mother to seek higher-level instruction for me. She enrolled me in the school of the regional ballet company, where I auditioned alongside older children and gained admission. This marked a significant commitment, as I now attended classes three afternoons per week in addition to Saturday mornings. Excited by the opportunity, I was delighted to discover that the teacher was the same ballerina I had encountered at six years old when I first ventured into ballet. Miss Tingley welcomed me with praise for my progress and high expectations for my future development. Determined to pursue ballet professionally, I vowed to work diligently under her guidance. Miss Tingley's rigorous teaching style challenged me to strive for perfection, yet her expertise and dedication made her a truly exceptional mentor. I gleaned a wealth of knowledge from her and held her talents in high regard, yet there were occasions when my presence seemed to irk her. It appeared that her vision of an ideal male dancer was one of rugged strength, capable of providing robust support to the prima ballerina's graceful movements. 
he was expected to possess the physical prowess required for lifts and the solidity akin to that of a ballet bar. However, I, being petite and exceptionally graceful for a boy, didn't fit this mold. Miss Tingley often remarked to the girls that my movements exuded a natural elegance surpassing their own. While she acknowledged my talent, she saw little utility for it in the context of my dance career. On one occasion after class, she suggested that I should have been born a girl, citing my long, proportionate legs, delicate hands, and expressive use of arms as qualities better suited for a ballerina. She likened my interpretation of music through movement to a captivating visual performance for the audience. Although her words puzzled me, I graciously accepted her praise. She mentioned then, and on numerous occasions afterward, that she thought it might be beneficial for me to get my hair trimmed. Let me take a moment to discuss my hair, my mom, and me. As I mentioned earlier, my mom adored my long hair. In my infancy, she allowed my blonde curls to cascade down my back until I reached the age of five. By that time, my hair had begun to straighten out, and its color transitioned from blonde to a light brown shade. As a compromise, she opted for a Dutch boy-style haircut. I stuck with that style until I turned eight. Mom and I had discussions about what I wanted to do with my hair. For some reason, I expressed my desire to let it grow longer. Mom, would it be all right if I grew my hair out? I don't think I'd like it short, I said. Upon hearing my request, my mom enthusiastically responded, Absolutely, Avery. You always looked so charming with long hair. It complements your face perfectly. How long do you want it to grow? I'm not sure, Mom. I'll leave that decision up to you when it looks right. You're the expert, I replied. She chuckled and said, I'm not entirely convinced that's a wise idea, Avery. I might prefer your lovely hair to reach your waist before I trim it. Let's start growing it out from your shoulders. We'll maintain even ends and see where it takes us. Longer hair will make it much easier to tie into a ponytail for dance class. To cut a long story short, we never halted the growth until it reached mid-back length. However, during that time, Miss Tingley informed me that if I intended to continue in her class with long hair, I must adhere to the ballet tradition of keeping hair off the neck, ruling out a ponytail. Mom conveyed to her my preference for long hair and her unwillingness to cut it. For my next class, Mom braided my hair, which garnered quite the attention from the girls in my class. Miss Tingley informed me, I'm sorry, Avery, but I don't allow braids in my class. Since you have long hair, you must wear it in a traditional ballet bun. Upon relaying this to my mom, she was initially surprised but asked, Do you mind wearing it in a bun, Avery? I'm happy to speak with Bibi if you want, but she's firm about ballet etiquette. Alternatively, we could cut it short to resolve the issue. What do you think? I was taken aback. Mom, are you suggesting that I cut my hair? I thought you loved it long. While I wasn't sure initially how much I'd enjoy having long hair, I've grown to love it and want it to remain long. I want it to grow even longer. I'm glad you feel that way, Avery. I adore your hair. It would have broken my heart if you wanted to cut it. It truly suits you, but I wanted you to be honest and not merely comply with my wishes. If you're okay with it, I'll gladly put it in a bun for you, she responded. I felt relieved. Thank you, Mom. I'll do whatever it takes for ballet. So, that's where I stood with my hair. I kept it at mid-back length until I moved to New York as a 19-year-old ballet dancer ready for prime time. Just before leaving Vermont, Mom trimmed it shorter to improve my chances of being hired by a major ballet company. It was a day that I'll always remember because we both shed tears afterward. It was a bittersweet moment, primarily reflecting on the love we shared and the emotions we experienced as my childhood came to a close. She only cut it to shoulder length, but it was certainly a shock to the system. Upon completing elementary school, my mother decided that I had endured enough taunting from my peers regarding my ballet training, my hair, and anything else that set me apart. For example, during fourth grade, we had weekly show-and-tell sessions. One winter Friday, I had just finished crafting a sewing project, a black velvet vest. 
I felt immensely proud of myself for mastering the intricate buttons and handling such a challenging material as velvet. Mom granted me permission to wear it to school, so I paired it with a white turtleneck and black pants. Initially, no one commented on my attire, but when it was my turn for show and tell, things took an unexpected turn. As I approached the front of the classroom, everyone anticipated that I would produce something from my pocket. Instead, I proudly announced that I had crafted the vest I was wearing. Instantly, chaos erupted in the classroom. You mean you sewed it, Avery? One girl questioned. Only girls sew, exclaimed another. The boys joined in with laughter at every remark the girls made. One girl, who had also joined ballet with me, pointed at me and jeered, Hey Avery, ballet boy, what else have you sewn? Planning to wear a dress for show and tell next week? It didn't take long for my teacher to intervene and quell the verbal onslaught from my classmates. Quiet, everyone. There is absolutely nothing wrong with boys learning to sew. Some of the world's greatest fashion designers are men. My father was a tailor, he possessed sewing skills and performed alterations on men's suits, crafting custom shirts and other garments for numerous individuals. I am proud of my father, and I am proud of Avery for his accomplishment. That is an excellent job, young man. You have many talents. Don't allow the immaturity of your classmates to deter you from pursuing your interests, Mrs. Green asserted. Gratefully, I returned to my seat, thanking Mrs. Green. When I recounted the incident to my mom that evening, she suggested, I believe we need to consider an alternative to public school for you next year. I think I know just the place. The following autumn, I found myself enrolled in a private academy situated approximately 25 miles south of our residence. Opting to be a day student rather than one of the 20 boarders, I made this decision to continue my ballet studies under the guidance of Miss Tingley and my mother. Additionally, I preferred staying at home because nothing compared to the joy of living with my mom, and I didn't want her to be alone. This school was remarkably small, exclusive, and forward-thinking. While it adhered to state regulations and boasted rigorous academic standards, it placed significant emphasis on the arts and individual expression. Catering to students from grades 5 through 8, my grade had only 8 individuals, with myself being the sole boy. However, the 6th grade housed 2 boys, the 7th grade also had 2, and the 8th grade had 1. Overall, the academy's total enrollment stood at 42 students, with boys constituting a mere 15% of the student body. Yet, such statistics held little significance to me. What truly appealed to me about this institution was the mutual respect among students and the celebration of each person's uniqueness. In particular, everyone excelled in art class, and to my astonishment, our physical education curriculum included dance, not classical ballet, but a form of movement and modern dance. This time around, no one made a fuss about my background in ballet, in fact, some girls even praised my abilities. While the dress code for dance class allowed for loose clothing, I opted to wear my dance wear. Some of my classmates were also ballet students and donned their ballet pink attire. However, what truly captivated me about my peers at this academy was their multifaceted talents, it seemed that everyone played a musical instrument, sang, practiced dance, or engaged in creative writing. Each child exuded creativity, and it was truly inspiring. Instead of facing ridicule as my hair grew longer, my classmates complimented me on its appearance. During my first week at lunch break, Betsy, a lovely girl with waist-length hair, kindly offered to braid mine. Surprisingly, upon returning to class, no one commented on my braided hair, we simply resumed our activities as if it were perfectly normal. We often had express yourself days at school, where the goal was to come to school and make a statement. The teachers left it up to us students to decide what to do. Initially, face painting was quite popular, followed by masks, sometimes eccentric clothing, and costumes portraying animals or famous figures. There was also occasional experimentation with temporary hair colors like green or blue. What did I do? Well, during my first year at the school, I typically wore different masks, fancy hats, and even once donned a lion costume. However, by the time I reached sixth grade, 
I made a conscious effort to enhance my sewing skills so that I, with my mom's assistance, could design unique outfits to wear on Express Yourself days. I transitioned from billowy purple pants to a neon green tunic, then to a yellow satin vest, and eventually to a thigh-length creation I adapted from a pattern for a girl's scoop neck jumper. This creation, sewn together from various plaid pieces, was particularly striking. I still keep it as a cherished memento. When I wore it, three girls in my class were so impressed that they asked if they could have it. Abby and Lauren remarked that it was the coolest creation they had seen in a long time and suggested it would be difficult to top myself after that. They even proposed that I wear it again but this time, really make a statement by pairing it with a turtleneck and tights. Initially, I hesitated, expressing concern about appearing too feminine. However, they reassured me, pointing out that I didn't mind having long hair or wearing tights for gym class. They also reminded me of my confidence in showcasing my sewing skills. Eventually, I agreed. To my surprise, everyone thought I looked fantastic. This experience highlighted the school's culture of freedom of expression, which I embraced proudly after some initial reluctance. Even my mom noticed the change in me. I felt so comfortable with my day as a girl that I didn't even think about changing back into pants and shoes after the morning makeover. When my mom picked me up, she expressed surprise but also seemed unfazed. She complimented my hair, makeup, and nails, remarking on how pretty I looked. During the ride home, she inquired about the reactions I received to my new look. Everyone thought I looked really cool, mom, and they said I was really brave for going through with it, I explained. She responded matter-of-factly, well, how do you feel dressed like that? Wearing tights to dance in isn't really the same as wearing them with a jumper. Quick to defend my choice, I interjected, Mom, you know this is a tunic. Without missing a beat, she replied, when you wear it with tights and patent leather Mary Yanes, my darling Avery, it's a jumper. Really, sweetheart, I have no problem at all with what you've done. I welcome it if that's really what you want to do. You have always been special in many ways. You know I've never been one to worry about boy things versus girl things, right? Miss Tingley has remarked on many occasions regarding your gracefulness and your beauty. You have always been a gentle, compassionate, sensitive child. I wouldn't have it any other way. Mum, it doesn't feel strange to me at all, really. I love to sew and design, and wear things that are comfortable, I affirmed. Then, something unexpected slipped out. You know, Mom, it really felt kind of neat when the girls were spending time this morning doing my hair and makeup. And after Abby was finished putting the polish on my nails, a strange feeling came over me. When they were done, looking in the mirror, I really thought that I looked nice. Am I strange for feeling that way? Tears started to well up, and Mom pulled over, stopping the car to hold me tightly in her arms. Dearest Avery, I think you look absolutely adorable. And it is completely natural for you to feel that way. If you like, I'll show you how to do your own makeup, and I see nothing wrong with keeping your nails looking neat and polished. I'll teach you how to care for your nails tonight after dinner. If no one at school cares how you look, then I see no reason for us to worry about it. In fact, how about if we schedule an appointment to get your hair and nails done at the salon in town later this week? Melanie, the owner, has done my hair for years and if I explain that this is a special treat for you, I'm sure she'd be happy to concoct something extraordinary. Gee, Mom, that would be neat. You don't mean that she would cut it, do you? I love it long, I asked anxiously. No, Avery, I was speaking about trimming your ends and bangs, and then setting it full of curls. Nothing permanent, just to see how pretty your hair would look that way. You have always had beautiful hair. Then we could go home and dress you in the outfit you have on now and take some pictures for posterity. That evening, at my mom's request, I remained dressed, and I received a comprehensive lesson on nail care. We decided that it would be prudent to primarily use clear polish, with an occasional light pink for special occasions. Nonetheless, I made a commitment to ensure that my nails were always neatly filed and polished. On Friday night, Mom drove me to her beauty salon for my scheduled appointment. We were the last clients, 
So the salon was deserted except for the three of us, and Melanie welcomed us warmly. Hello, Dana. It's great to see you again. And this must be Avery. I've heard so much about you, dear. I understand that you are quite the dancer. And, my, my, don't you have such beautiful long hair? What are we going to do with it tonight? You don't want me to cut it short now, do you? Oh no, I replied eagerly, I don't want my hair cut. Mom suggested that I could try seeing what my hair looks like with curls in it. Ah, I see, Melanie responded with a twinkle in her eye, are we going to give you a perm tonight? Maybe a spiral perm would be fitting, Dana. I believe Avery would look adorable with a head full of cascading curls. I glanced at my mom, seeking clarification. No, no perm tonight, my mom stated matter-of-factly. I just want to treat Avery to a beauty makeover so that he gets to experience how the other side gets pampered, just like we discussed on the phone. I couldn't quite grasp my mom's rationale behind this experience for me, but I felt captivated as I stood there, unable to move. Part of me questioned, why are you doing this? While another part of me welcomed it with open arms. Melanie guided me to the sink and began washing my hair, which felt incredibly soothing, almost like a scalp massage. Then, she directed me to the chair in front of the mirror. As she combed through my hair, she continuously praised its beauty, remarking that she had never seen a young boy with such magnificent hair. When she reached for her scissors, I instinctively pleaded, Please, don't cut my hair. Melanie reassured me, placing her hands gently on my shoulders, and said, Don't worry, sweetheart, I'm only going to trim your ends and your bangs, okay? I wouldn't want to cut off any of these beautiful locks. I completely understand how you feel. When I was a girl, I had waist-length hair until I turned 16. Nothing seemed as important to me as my hair. After swiftly trimming my hair, she began sectioning it and applying a spray before rolling each section with large curlers. As I glanced in the mirror, my head looked rather amusing. There, she said, when your hair dries, it will be full of big, bouncy curls. Let's put you under the dryer while I take care of your nails. As I sat beneath the dryer, feeling the hot air blowing over my head and the tightness of the curlers pulling on my hair, which was quite painful for the first time, I observed Melanie wheeling over a table containing the nail care items my mom had recently taught me to use. Well, Avery, my mom chimed in, clearly enjoying the experience, now we get to witness how a true professional works on your nails. Avery, Melanie remarked with a hint of surprise, it looks like your nails are already done. How long have you been doing your nails, dear? Did your mom teach you? I must say, they look very tidy, very lovely. You don't mind me calling them pretty, do you? I replied, no, Mrs. Dexter, I like the way my nails look, and mom taught me how to take care of them just last week. I don't mind if you think they are pretty. Thank you for noticing. You're the most polite young gentleman I've ever encountered, she exclaimed. Let's see if I can't show you a few tricks to make them look even nicer, as long as you promise to come back every so often and let me have my way with you again. Mom interjected, Melanie, I have a feeling that tonight might just be the first of many. Keep up the good work, we're both enjoying this. Melanie then removed the clear polish from my nails, tended to my cuticles, and filed them into elegant rounded arches. Finally, she inquired, Avery, do you always paint your nails with clear polish? I responded, yes, Mrs. Dexter. Well then, she exclaimed, let's be bold tonight and go with pink. I have five different shades for you to choose from. Or perhaps you'd like me or your mom to decide. It's okay if you decide, Mrs. Dexter, you're the expert. Well, Avery, this is actually the first time I've ever chosen a shade of nail polish for a young man's fingernails. But I have to admit, I think that on your beautiful hands, it's very appropriate for you to have manicured nails. Let's try this medium pink. I think it's just right. She proceeded to apply multiple coats of polish. After a half hour of drying, she applied a special clear tarp coat. That will protect your nails from chipping, dear. Don't they look so pretty? Let's take you back to my station and comb out your hair. And then I'll work on your face a little. 
You mean my mom told you to put makeup on me too? I said, feeling somewhat disoriented. Yes, dear, she requested the whole makeover. She thought that you deserved the complete package tonight. You can decide how far we go with your makeup, but she thought that it would be good if you saw how I do your face so that as you get older, and the time comes for you to do it yourself, you know. Oh yes, Mrs. Dexter, for dance productions, we need to do our faces for presence on stage, under the lights, I said. This will be good training. Well, dear, what I'm going to do is a little bit more subtle than stage makeup, more like everyday girl makeup, but I'm sure it will apply, she replied. She started with a light foundation, and her brushwork was that of a fine artist on a virgin canvas. It tickled me, and I was swept away as she moved on to my eyes and then to my lips, witnessing a remarkable transformation before me in the mirror. I believe that she did too, as did my mother. Melanie quickly took the curlers out of my hair and brushed it. She used a curling iron for a few touch-ups and to curl my bangs. As I looked up, my mom rose from the chair and stood rather still, taking in my new look with the same bewilderment that I was experiencing. I think I even saw a few tears escaping down her cheek. I don't know what to say, she gasped. You look exquisite, Avery. Melanie has done a magnificent job. I know exactly what to say, Melanie chimed in proudly. Avery, you look absolutely adorable. I know that this is just a one-time special treat for you and your mom, but I must say that between your natural good looks, how we've done your face, and your most beautiful hair, you are prettier than most every little girl that has come through the doors of this establishment. I hope that comment doesn't embarrass you, but I just can't help telling you that. You are just so strikingly beautiful. Well, it did and yet it didn't. I didn't know why I was feeling that way then, although I do now, but after I thanked Melanie sincerely, and Mom paid her, adding that we'd be back again soon, we both left the salon walking on cloud nine. Mom knew that I was happy, and I sensed that Mom was somehow content with what she had done. When we reached home, Mom had me change into my jumper and tights and spent at least a half an hour taking pictures with her camera. She and I still have those pictures. This beautiful awakening was just the beginning of a period of exploration for me and Mom. She enjoyed it, I was captivated by it, and there wasn't anyone telling us that it wasn't proper. Sure, I got strange looks from Miss Tingley the next day in ballet class. The only remnant of my makeover was my nails, but that was plenty to elicit comments from all. Did I care? Strangely, no. It was almost as if my pink nails became my badge of courage. I made sure that my nails were pink for every class after that. Instead of attending high school, I was homeschooled by my mom. This arrangement allowed us to dedicate at least two hours every day to the dance studio, not to mention the six hours per week spent taking classes at the regional company school in the city. My mom also intensified her own involvement in dancing, taking on classes and securing small roles with the company. I cannot overstate the significance of her dance instruction in my life. As I spent the majority of my time at home, my mom continued to support my exploration. I learned to style my own hair, and I always made sure to keep my nails well manicured and polished. Since a substantial portion of my day was spent in the dance studio, I would wear jumpers, swing dresses, poet's blouses, and oversized sweaters over my tights when I wasn't dancing. Mom purchased tights for me in various colors, allowing me to wear them during our home training sessions. However, for classes at the dance company, I had to adhere to the traditional black attire. Often, when postal delivery or UPS personnel arrived at our door, they would address me with, I have a package for the Hendricksons, miss. But it wasn't as if I was consciously trying to be a girl, it simply felt natural to wear what I felt comfortable in. Friday nights at our house were designated as luxury nights, during which both my mom and I indulged in long baths, manicures, and occasionally, facials. It was an incredibly soothing routine. You might wonder if I wore my jumpers and similar attire when venturing into town or even to dance class. The answer is no, I typically opted for sweats and jeans. However, there was one exception, a memorable outing with three of the girls from my Saturday ballet class to the mall. 
They thought it would be fun if they could transform me into a girl for the afternoon. Wanting to make friends, I called mom and informed her that I'd be heading to the mall and would arrange for a ride home around dinner time. I mentioned that I'd be joining a few classmates. It seemed like mom was quite pleased, especially since I hadn't socialized much since my days at the private academy. So, we drove in Brooke's car to Wendy's house. There, they led me into Wendy's room, her parents were out, and began their makeover. They had me stripped down to my dance belt, and they were amazed at how smooth my body was, especially my legs. You don't shave your legs regularly, do you, Avery? Brooke asked. They look so smooth. Well, I stuttered weakly, yes, I do. I prefer to have them hair-free when I wear dance tights for recitals. That's a bit strange, remarked Bridget mockingly. After all, the last time you needed to wear white tights was four months ago for the Nutcracker. Hasn't your hair grown back, or do you regularly shave them for that silky smooth look when you wear sheer hose with short skirts, she added with a teasing tone. Maybe this isn't such a great idea, I mumbled, but Brooke reassured me, saying, it's okay, Avery, we love you just the same. It saves us from having to shave you ourselves, although I think Bridget was looking forward to it. Anyway, my aunt is Melanie Dexter, and she told me all about your visits to her salon. That's how we came up with this idea. We thought you might like it. Everybody knows that you're special in many ways. All three girls giggled. It's okay, really, I insisted, and so we proceeded. They started with sheer black pantyhose, a first for me. I actually bought these this morning for you when I was restocking for myself. It looks like I found the perfect size. Your legs are so long and well-defined for a guy, Avery, Wendy remarked with a hint of admiration. They really look pretty. Some girl must have gotten your legs when the stork made his deliveries, and you got hers. Boy, did she get robbed. Next, they put me in a short pleated black skirt. This is my older sister's skirt. It looks great on you, Wendy commented. She's not into dance and isn't as petite as me, but she's a perfect match for your size, Avery. Let's try a bra on him, girls. It's only fitting that Avery experience as much of the real thing as we can provide. I hesitated, why would I need a bra, Wendy? My chest is flat. Bridget interjected firmly, we'll fill your bra with nylon stockings for today, Avery, so you can add some shape to the form-fitting blouse I've picked out for you to wear. I bet all those times when you've had your hair, makeup, and nails done by Melanie, you must have entertained the thought of becoming a real girl, complete with your own chest. Come on, be honest with us. No, you guys, really, I never did. I never wanted to be a girl. I just like being an individual, that's all, I replied. Sure, Avery, teased Bridget. Bridget, knock it off. Avery is a sweet guy with a unique perspective. Let's help him explore the possibility today that it might be nice to be a girl, right? said Brooke, trying to defuse the situation. The girls all nodded and winked. After putting on the bra, stuffing stockings into both cups, I was handed the blouse to put on. Since I had worn billowy poet blouses at home, I was able to quickly button this blouse, which, of course, had the buttonholes on the opposite side as a guy's shirt does. Hey, Avery, Wendy observed, you really buttoned up that blouse with ease. Perhaps this isn't your first time wearing a girl's blouse, is it? Do you dress up like a girl often? No, I suppose I'm just quite skilled with my hands. Absolutely, all the girls chorus together. The clothes fit you perfectly, Avery. How about a chunky pair of Doc Martens? My sister has a pair that might fit you perfectly. They're quite feminine, complete with a sexy ankle strap and two-inch heels in black patent leather, Wendy suggested. So, I slipped into the shoes. Take a walk to see how you manage in those heels, darling, Brooke suggested. I took a turn around the room with confidence. Wow. You walk like you've been wearing heels for ages. You'd think you've been studying point with the way you balance on your toes. This is your first time wearing heels, right? Bridget questioned skeptically. Little did they know, my mom had been teaching me toe dancing for over a year by then. She believed it would be beneficial for my career. 
I wasn't sure why, but I never doubted my mom's wisdom. However, I wasn't about to disclose the fact that I was probably as skilled at toe dancing as they were. No, I guess it's just all those years of ballet, girls, really. Then it was time to sit down while Brooke did my makeup, and Bridget added fullness to my hair with some strategically placed curls. As Bridget worked on my bangs, she remarked, Avery, I must say I adore your hair. It's so full and shiny. Even though no boy should have hair that looks this beautiful, it most certainly suits you. Thank you, Bridget. I quite like it too, I replied. While Brooke worked on my eyes, she noticed my lashes. Avery, you genuinely have girls' eyelashes. They're so long and pretty, with a natural curl. I can't wait to finish with your face. You have a rosy complexion and soft, flawless skin. Any girl would envy your dimples. You're going to turn out so pretty. I think I'll use a pink lipstick that matches your feminine fingernails. I've never seen a guy's hands that could pass for a girl's hands like yours can. Are you letting your nails grow longer? When we were partnering in class this morning, I felt something digging into my torso during a lift. Were those your nails, dear? How long do you plan to let them grow? Not too long, I hope, or Miss Tingley will have you in pink tights and toe shoes being lifted into the air by hands, that handsome exchange student from Finland. Here's a dream. You're still a better dancer, though. No, Brooke, it's just that I have to file them tonight when I get home. I'm not planning on letting them get any longer. After they finished primping my hair and face, we tried on a short black bolero-style jacket. There, all done, Avery. Let's head to the mall, Wendy announced. The mall was out of town, and most people didn't know me, but the girls made a point of introducing me to as many friends as possible on a Saturday. Did they reveal that I was a guy? No, but I'm not so sure our secret remained a secret after they dropped me off that evening. Before we entered, I pleaded with them not to bump into any guys, and to their credit, they kept their word. We grabbed lunch first and then went from store to store trying on clothes. Did I participate? Absolutely. That was part of their plan. Did I end up buying anything? As part of our agreement to keep my identity a secret, I had to purchase a makeup kit and promise to attend every Saturday ballet class with my face made up. They agreed that I only needed to lightly do my eyes, cheeks, and lips. I think they believed I wouldn't be capable of fulfilling my part of the promise or that I'd overdo the job and embarrass myself in front of Miss Tingley. What they didn't know was that I was quite skilled at makeup by then, thanks to my mom's guidance, Melanie's instruction, and lots of practice at home. I had no trouble meeting their expectations. Although they never asked to dress me up again, the girls genuinely bonded with me and felt comfortable including me as a friend. We often went out for pizza together after class, and I have no evidence to suggest that they disclosed our special Saturday to anyone. Eventually, I even invited them over to my house one Saturday after dance class and showed them my sunroom studio, introducing them to my mom. They were enamored with my private ballet studio space and eagerly performed grand jetés across the floor to the bar by the full-length mirror. This is amazing, Avery, exclaimed Bridget. I wish I had a studio like this at my house. As I headed to my room to grab a CD for us to listen to on the studio sound system, the girls unintentionally followed me. Brooke noticed the sewing machine sitting on my desk. Avery, why do you have a sewing machine in your room? The other girls turned to me with wide eyes and questioning stares. I replied matter-of-factly, well, my mom taught me to sew when I was very young, and I've enjoyed it for years now. I take pride in starting with some fabric and a pattern and ending up with something wearable. Could you show us something you've sewn, please? Wendy requested. So I opened my closet and pulled out a few vests. These are lovely, Avery. I'd love to wear that dark green satin vest myself. But what else do we see in your closet? Are those jumpers? Is that a velvet swing dress next to that coat? It seemed inevitable. I felt no shame in my choice of attire or how I styled my hair or nails before, so why start now? Was I going to hide something I felt was natural for me? I did what was honest, as always, and showed the girls all of my belongings. 
Wow, Avery, we thought when we dressed you up, it was a first for you. It seems like you've been embracing your feminine side for a long time at home, exclaimed Brooke. No, Brooke, I've never sewn these clothes with the intention of wearing them as girls' things. I know it sounds insincere and far-fetched, but it's true. The clothes I create are just for wearing at home over my dancewear when I'm relaxing. Please believe me. When you girls dressed me in pantyhose and a bra, that was definitely a first for me. Sure, whatever, said Bridget. Let me ask you, Avery, if you could, would you want to be a girl all the time? I mean, have a chest like ours, deal with menstruation, and get rid of that thing you keep in your dance belt. Seems like you're almost there now. Bridget, I never really thought about it. You three are really the first people my age who know anything about my home life. Then Wendy interjected, Avery, what are a pair of Capizio toe shoes doing beside your bed? Are they yours, by chance? Are you going to tell us that you actually dance en point? Yes, my mom has been teaching me at home for over a year now. She thought I would benefit from the training. Well then, Avery, you must show us right now. Lace up those pink satin ribbons and show us what you can do. Wait a minute, girls, let's just pause for a second. Avery, this is a lot for us to take in all at once, Brooke said solemnly. I want you to know that no matter what you do, I think you're a good person, and I will always be your friend, whether you stay a guy or become a girl or something in between. Thank you for being honest with us. And I believe I can speak for my friends when I say we won't make an issue out of this. We always knew you as a great dancer, a little distant, and very different. We knew about your beauty salon visits, and of course, when we first met you. I mean, how many guys come to ballet class with their hair in a bun and pink fingernails? So, I guess even though we're somewhat stunned by what you've shown us, we can't be that surprised. But over the past few months, you've shown us that although you may seem odd on the outside, you're a genuinely beautiful person on the inside. On the outside, he's genuinely beautiful too, chided Bridget. Stop it, Brooke continued. But we still like you, right, girls? All three nodded, and I offered a hug to each. I must say, Bridget added, if you ever decide to become a girl, you will definitely be a beautiful one. Little did she know what the future held. I never forgot that day and I have promised myself that I will soon visit my friends and reignite our special friendship. As mentioned earlier, I visited Melanie regularly for additional salon treatments. I even tried a spiral perm once, at my mom's suggestion. Although I was initially captivated by it, maintaining it proved to be too much work to get it just right, especially when I had to put it into a bun for ballet. I was relieved when the curls finally disappeared, even though it took months and professional straightening. I vowed never to do it again. Brooke, Bridget, and Wendy remained close, but as school activities and boys consumed more of their time, they gradually stopped dancing. Our meetings became infrequent. Throughout my high school years, everyone who knew me acknowledged my uniqueness but also recognized my talent. I felt no shame in my appearance or actions. I was a dancer above all else and I found the support I needed from the one who knew me best, my mom. Now, at twenty, I moved to New York with my mom's blessing and spent the first two months searching for work. I auditioned for four different companies but failed to secure a position as a dancer. The feedback was consistent. While I was highly skilled and exceptionally graceful for a male dancer, my body proportions posed a significant challenge. Being petite as a young boy may have been endearing, but in the ballet world, having a disproportionate torso-to-leg ratio is grounds for rejection. The companies told me I had the body of a ballerina, with my long legs and small upper torso. Am I disappointed about the possibility of not dancing with a major ballet company? Certainly. However, I did find a role in an experimental ballet collective, which I have enjoyed, albeit without financial compensation. I do feel cheated out of my dream career but there is a silver lining. Six months ago, I met a woman in a coffee bar who has since changed my life in ways I never imagined, although Brooke, Bridget, and Wendy may have predicted it. She is a wonderful, compassionate, and understanding person, 
and I have grown to adore and love her. Her name is Clara, originally from Germany, and she is 26 years old, working as a fashion photographer. Professionally, she excels and is widely respected. If ballet was my passion, then photography is hers. In fact, I have become the subject of much of her personal work. It began with simple shots around the studio for her records and my portfolio, but as she continued, she noticed something intriguing. She exclaimed, Avery, you are a natural in front of the camera. You come alive in my lens. You are wasting your time dancing every day. Come work for me. At first, I didn't fully grasp what she meant, but am I unhappy that I said yes? Not at all. It feels as natural to me now as when I embarked on my ballet journey. As I shared my life story with Clara, recounting it in the same manner I've detailed it for you, she gazed at me and remarked, Your upbringing seems so natural for you, unlike anyone else I've ever met. It's what truly captivates me about you. Would you allow me to shape you into the special person I believe we both could find contentment and satisfaction with? I've fallen deeply under your spell, I replied, lost in a loving daze. I am at your will, dearest Clara. You have my permission to do anything you wish. I trust your judgment completely. But may I inquire about your intentions? I'm not entirely sure I understand what you're proposing. Well, Allow me to explain further. Do I still dance? Yes, indeed. We've arranged a space in our third-story Greenwich loft with mirrors and a bar where I practice most days for at least an hour and a half. Apart from the experimental collective, I even attend a class downtown on Tuesday nights. But there's a twist, it's a point class. Toe dancing. Mom taught me en point at home when I was a teenager but I never had the opportunity to use it as a male dancer. However, that's no longer an issue. In the eyes of the women in the class, mostly young professionals who dabbled in ballet during their youth while pursuing finance and economics degrees at prestigious universities, all in preparation for their careers on Wall Street, I am Avery, an 18-year-old female who also does some fashion modeling. Dancing in that class feels incredibly comfortable because, above all, it's about the ballet, it's not about gender. So after years of wearing the standard dance attire, white tee and black tights, I now have the privilege of donning a black leotard, pink tights, and those exquisitely painful yet beautiful pink toe shoes. Over the past five months, Clara has documented my transformation through a series of photographs, and the changes are remarkable. Yet, as I reflect on the days of my youth mentioned earlier in this narrative, it all feels so natural to me. It becomes evident that this path Clara has accelerated was initiated under the nurturing guidance of my mom. That first day when I bared all, demonstrating that I could wear tights and acknowledge my identity as a male ballet dancer, was as significant an event as any in a person's life. What do I look like now? If you browse through a J.C. Penney's catalogue or peruse Newport News, Belmont Fair, Land's End, or a few other catalogues, you'll find me. Could you tell that I'm not really female? I wouldn't wager on it. Am I content in front of the camera? Absolutely. How do I feel strutting down Fifth Avenue in a stunning Armani suit with a billowy silk blouse, a short skirt, sheer black hose, and three-inch heels? Like a beautiful woman, what else? Do my modeling colleagues know? No, they don't. Do I anticipate they'll eventually discover the truth? By the time that happens, I doubt it will matter. I am who Clara and I choose to be, whether it's a ballet dancer, a model, or a loving partner. Gradually, Clara has guided me through a transformative journey that might seem rushed on the surface, yet has been meticulously planned with consideration for my emotions and initial concerns about the permanence of the changes, which are now fading remarkably quickly. It's one thing to undergo a haircut and style that leans towards femininity, a shoulder-length page boy with a body wave that delicately curls the ends as they rest upon my shoulders. The sensation of turning my head and feeling my hair sway gently from side to side is something I adore. Perhaps I never quite got over the Dutch boy cut. Embracing regular makeup application, hairstyling, and nail care, even allowing my nails to grow quite long, this new routine makes typing quite an adventure. I often ponder that Friday night when, at 12, 
I experienced my first beauty makeover, would Melanie approve of my current hair, makeup, and nails? But all of these things can be reversed, removed, or erased. Not so with the other changes. First, there were the pierced ears. While I'm aware that many men sport pierced ears today, for me, it signified a sense of permanence. A month later, Clara arranged regular electrolysis appointments for me. Despite having very little hair, she insisted on permanently removing any facial hair. For someone who once found dancing EN point painful, I developed a new threshold for pain through electrolysis. Yet, as I felt so alien on the day I donned my first pair of tights, that same sensation revisited me when the technician finished shaping my eyebrows and revealed her work in the mirror. I nearly fainted at the sight. It was then, gazing at my reflection, complete with finely arched brows, that I realized the irrevocability of the change. A month ago, Clara took me to a plastic surgeon for collaging implants in my lips. The difference in my appearance is astounding, the addition of full, pouty, sexy lips, as she calls them. Clara is enamored with my new look, as am I. I can always discern her delight, she immediately reaches for her camera and snaps countless pictures of me. What is it that makes me feel so wonderful most recently, even more? Alive then with the changes that I have previously described? That Clara, in her love and support, has on a daily basis for the past three months been blessing me with hormones to reshape my body. As proud as I am about my dancing, I am like that same little child that came out of his first ballet. Lesson with excitement and awe about my developing chest. Small, yes, my mother was slight, great for a dancer, so my hopes don't rest on large expectations, but definitely developing. It's so wonderful to feel the sensitivity, the nipples especially, the vision in the mirror as I watch my areolas darken and increase in size. Clara can actually cup my chest in her petite hand and is ecstatic about doing so. It brings us both great joy. Have we considered the expected loss of my male function due to the large consumption of estrogen? Yes, and it the feeling of both of us that our lovemaking is tender, passionate, and usually very feminine. Clara actually prefers me to satisfy her as a woman would, and I feel quite comfortable with that. We use a dildo, but we spend most of our lovemaking using our tongues, lips, fingers, and imagination in a gentle interplay of feminine synergy. What about mom? Does she know? Of course she does. We visit her. Often. She recently came to New York and stayed with us for a couple of days. She mentioned to me just yesterday, Avery, you are becoming the beautiful person that in my heart I always knew you were inside. I don't know why, but I just always knew it would turn out like this. I guess I always dreamed of you as a beautiful daughter, and I suppose I should take much of the responsibility for nurturing you in a way that made it so easy for you to accept and welcome the changes that Clara has so suitably provided for you. I only hope that you are as happy as you've made me proud for the wonderful individual that you are. With tears in my eyes and my mascara running, I hugged my mom tightly, saying only I love you forever.